All right, let's get started. How was everybody this morning? Good. Good day so far? Good. Good day yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. All right. How many of you showed up at our 20 tools session yesterday that we had? Wow. Woo. All Thank right. you. I've had a lot of people asking about that list, and that deck is part of the TechEd decks that are published. But what I will do is one day this week, uh, I'll take that single slide that had all those great URLs, and I will publish it to my blog, maybe by Friday at some point this week. Uh, I have five sessions, so it's a busy week. But if you go to Windows Team Blog, click on Springboard. I promise by the end of the week, by at the end of the day Friday, I'll have at least that slide with all the resources posted. Yeah. So uh, if, keep an eye for that. It's great because people have stopped me and obviously saw great value. So thank you. If you haven't filled out a survey uh, and you want to have something positive to say, please do. If you hated the session, don't worry about the survey. It's okay. <laughs> Of course, so. if you need to get the tools before that, uh, feel free to send us email. Uh, right. I'll be more than happy to uh, forward you the deck if you and, need it. And of course, go out to Springboard, Microsoft.com forward slash Springboard. Go to the deploy area. You're going to see most of the tools. MDT, Act, Map, all the downloads for those are in that area. So thank you very much. At the end of the day today, uh, at 5 o'clock, I have a session that will be really focusing in on MDT. Um, it's sort of the second half of this presentation. So if you go, hey, I'd love to see that again would like it a little bit slower, kind of just see that whole second half really spread out over a full uh, hour, then come to the session today at 5. If you really go, hey, I got that MDT portion, I'm great, got it down, don't need to see it again, then uh, you'll find that that session is partially repeating some of the content. So I just wanted to give you a heads up, because I hate for someone to go going, hey, if I knew a lot of this was repeated, I would have gone to a different session. So uh, it's your choice, just letting you know um, up front. So let's get started. It is uh, Tony and I back again. And we're going to talk about redelivering a user's old Windows XP environment inside their new Windows 7 PC via Microsoft Deployment Toolkit with P2V. I didn't write out physical to virtual because it then would have officially had the longest title at TechEd for a single session. <laughs> so I decided not to do that. So the first thing to understand about the P2V add-in, and very simply, uh, what it does is the P2V migration, it is an add-in to MDT. It can also be added to SCCM or WDS. Uh, it converts a user's existing Windows XP environment to a virtual hard disk. It then automates the delivery of an updated and personalized Windows 7 operating system containing a virtual machine with the user's previous Windows environment, application, and web browser. So this goes beyond XP mode. So let's kind of take a minute and explain XP mode and MedV and P to V, so that we're all on the same page for the rest of this discussion. So XP mode. XP mode is a way to deliver a single application that only runs in Windows XP to a Windows 7 user. It is meant for a small group of people. It should not be used for probably more than 20, 25 users. It's great when you go, the one thing that's keeping us from moving to Windows 7 is the 10 people in our finance department. Because they have this application that absolutely, positively will not run in Windows 7. There is no update version. It isn't there. Therefore, we're going to put just that application on XP mode. Because at the core, the object is not to put people on Windows 7 to continue to use Windows XP. It's to get them off of Windows XP. Windows XP and IE6 are the single most vulnerable point on that PC. Windows XP, we stop. Hang on, what's the date? Let's take a look. We have 1,056 more days left. That's it. As a matter of fact, this app doesn't even run in Windows XP. So there you go. It only runs in Windows <laughs> You can download it from my blog, but it's a countdown. It takes you at the spring where it tells you exactly how many days are left. So we got till 2014. The big problem that we run into is people still using IE6, and IE6 is a huge area for hackers. It is what hackers are physically focusing themselves at to go after and Windows XP. We're only doing top level security patches. It is no longer a supported product unless you're on extended support. And if you are, you are paying a lot of money. So XP mode is great for that. But remember, if you've just put 25 people on XP mode, you have now added 25 more machines that you need to manage because you need to join those to the domain. You need to add antivirus. You need to patch them. You need to manage them. You are now increasing the actual number of PCs. X P to V mode goes a whole step further. What P to V is going to do is P to V takes the complete Windows XP machine and virtualizes that whole machine. Apps, browser, the whole nine yards. And what it does is it puts it inside of your Windows 7 machine. 
I refer to P2V as really a safety net. If you are a consultant, go into a company, and the person, like I said, I used this analogy yesterday, the person who writes the checks say, hi, by the way, this app that you're about to move over to Windows 7, if it doesn't work when I get to Windows 7, you're not getting paid because now I can't write you a check. Okay, maybe a P2V mode might be a good opportunity. And the customer is a software assurance volume licensing customer. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then you would use that because that way, in case that application does not work as advertised in Windows 7, you still have that XP environment. That person can still launch that XP environment, use that application, launch it, and use it. So it's XP mode on steroids. But again, we're not getting people off of I, we're not getting people out of XP. Now we're giving them XP inside of seven, and it's going to be a slower experience, not a native experience, and not the best experience for them to have. It is a great safety net. Once you prove that the applications work in Windows 7, that you've done your work around app compat, you've done your work around deployment and testing, then you can delete that old VHD, that XP image, and they're on seven, and that's great. It's a good safety net. The third is MedV. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Tony's going to do a very, very nice demo on MedV. But MedV, we are actually virtualizing and delivering that user's application to their desktop. They see an icon, they double click it, they launch it, and they are able to utilize it. What is great about MedV is it is absolutely seamless to the end user. They don't realize, Tony's going to show you, the only thing they see is that their application is not using Arrow Glass, but we delivered it. It is a managed version of XP, it is a, of, of XP mode. It is a faster version. We're not putting a whole OS on that machine. We are streaming down that application the first time, and then we're running it inside that managed, virtualized, thin environment. So it's very important to remember that. The other key about, XP, about this P2V that we're talking about today is you must have software assurance volume licensing. If you are not a SAVL customer, you cannot use this legally, which means if you're a home user, if you're on pro, if you're buying single SKUs, unless you are software assurance and volume licensing, you cannot use this. You will not be in license compliance. Third, something important to remember, with SAVL, this is your only way to virtualize IE6 legally. There is no other way to do it. You cannot use third-party apps. None of our competitors, none of our other companies that offer software virtualization, whether using you know, AppDNA or any of those, you cannot legally have two versions of a browser on the same machine unless you are using a Microsoft virtualization solution. You should be aware of that. That's something else too. So there's compliance issues too. When we get into licensing, I'm not going to talk about software assurance, volume licensing, how it works. Go talk to CDW. Go talk to your Microsoft partner on how that works. This is a great solution for those of you that have it. It is a great solution for those of you thinking to moving to software assurance, volume licensing that need that. But I wanted to set that up, and we'll dig a little deeper into the virtualization solutions and how this works. So how did this all come to be? Well, we had a lot of key ingredients ready. There was the Microsoft MDT deployment toolkit as an infinitesimally customizable engine. We had uh, Mark Rosinovich's Cisternals Disk to VHD, uh, which was really sort of the basis for the P2V tool. We had VPC, virtual PC with shell integration. We had remote hot fixes for everything XP, SP3, and newer. And we had a fix for hardware-assisted virtualization emulation, which is now part of it. Uh, yeah. More specifically, we had all of these. I was remembering when uh, Jeremy was working on yep. this back in the days, because uh, he loved the MDT. And he started thinking about like, hey, what, what if I could get that XP image to actually grab that and, and mount it back as a sort of XP mode in Windows 7. And he started playing around with the, uh, the, uh, P, uh, the uh, disk hard disk tool from uh, mm -hmm. Marcus and Rich, <clears throat> ran into some problems. So he started emailing Mark back and forth like, hey, if I want to do this tool, um, could you fix this for me? And Mark went like, yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, way to do it. So he actually fixed the tool so that it would work for the P2V migration. Yep. Michael Lee House, if you've said any of his sessions, was also a big part of this as well. So then the idea started to really grow. What if we took MDT, the config manager, initiate it, runs a fully automatic uh, migra OS migration process. We add then the new Cisternals disk to VHD EXE, which converts the XP to a VHD. And then finally, Windows 7 is installed with applications, user state, previous Windows XP and apps. The disk to VHD uses a volume snatch-up capability that we introduced back in XP 2003. VHD conversions can be performed online and saved to the same volume. It's free and very powerful, and as we showed yesterday in our session, you can even take that VHD and you can attach it so you can access the data within it, but you won't be able to obviously do the apps or anything like that without running it through VPC. So when does this make sense? 
Not for, every uh, not for every desktop, but for every organization. You would not do this out to 5,000 desktops. This would make your life eminently more difficult than it already is. What it is good is, like I said, for that small group of users where this cannot fail. If they don't have that app on Monday, I'm in trouble. Business stops. We have problems. And having that aspect of a safety net without having to create a whole other XP machine and do that becomes a great make, creates a great opportunity for people to store that information. When we cannot fix or purchase a native working application, there's just absolutely no way to do it, and it has to go out. When, there's a standardized v when a standardized VPC image will not suffice, when just creating a virtual PC of XP is not going to do it, which often is really good for just a single app, but there's no way to install it. There's too many apps. It's too intricate. There's macros. There's all, just too much stuff going on that we just can't be sure that we're going to get that one over the hump in time. Critical users with highly specialized desktop, and everything must return. When the deployment, of course, must go on. So some limitations. Windows XP applications can only be retained in VHD if the customer installed themselves, not the OEM, using VL Media, and customer has the re-imaging rights. VPC only supports VHD captured disks up to 127 gigs. If you're over 127 gigs, this doesn't work, considering most of the machines that were bought in that XP time frame were somewhere between 40 to about 128. You can do that. You may need to reduce the size of that image some way, shape, or form to do it. But that is a limitation of the uh, P2V tool. Companies may be too slow to replace XP applications with Windows 7 native apps. So it's certainly something to kind of keep in mind. So there's kind of an eye chart, which uh, Tony and I put together, which was kind of nice. But uh, it really kind of goes through. You want to take a minute to go through? You want me to go through it? Uh, let's do it together. Sure. <clears throat> so when we take a look, for example, at XP mode, time to require identify fix issues is low. Waiting for ISV support is low. Those are good opportunities to UXP mode. Where it's not good is centralized manageability, uh, user-specific apps. It's not very lightweight. Also, we don't have IE6 URL redirection. Do you want to talk for a minute about IE6 URL redirection? Yeah, so when we look at the uh, MDOT tool, the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack, <clears throat> one of the tools that's in there is the Microsoft Enterprise Desktop Virtualization Solution, which is called MedV. So MedV is actually XP mode but then in a managed way, so that the image is actually managed. And what it comes with, it comes with a service that runs on that Windows 7 client. Now, if the user is going to hit a URL that we know have compliance, uh, compatibility issues, you actually know that this site will only work well in IE6, then the end user experience will be nothing more than automatically IE6 will pop up from that virtual machine and the web page will be loaded there. So it's one of those things that really helps to have the end user be almost like transparent in their experience working with these older websites. And we'll show a demo of that uh, yeah, when we get we'll to the Metsy part. We kick into <clears throat> and also like how we, uh, how we work with that, yeah. yeah. So let's take a look at MDT itself. First of all, I want to kind of take a poll on how many images you manage. So if you only manage one image in your IT environment, raise your hand. Good, good amount of you. How about two to five? Wow, six to 10, 11 to 20, more than 20. Wow, do you guys need hugs or something? That's insane. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna make your life way better. You're gonna love the session I'm doing because I'm gonna show you if you have one image, that's all you ever need. You will never need more than one image again. So before we jump in, let's kind of get you in the right mindset. Let's talk about XP. Let's talk about what the world was like when XP came out back in 2001 because Ghost doesn't make sense anymore. It did back in the XP days. And people say, no, no, it does. And I'm like, all right, well, let's take a look at all the other stuff that came out in 2001. That was a brand new cell phone in 2001. I showed that to my daughter. She says, how do you surf the web on that? I said, we don't. She goes, how do you buy apps on that? I'm like, we didn't. She goes, what did you do with it? I'm like, we made calls, and then we hit buttons 26 times to say hi, because you had to hit the six button five times to go through the caps and the smalls. She looked at me like, yeah, right. She's eight. How about that one? It was basically a blow dryer that made popcorn. <laughs> the Walkman. You always knew when somebody had a bad Walkman experience because you'd see a cassette tape strewn in the gutter with about 30 feet of tape behind it. And you would wait for the songs to start to kind of go as it get towards the batteries would go down. Yeah, remember how big and heavy those things were too now compared to like the MP3 players of today? They weighed like a pound. You'd stick them in your pocket, they'd be all jutting out. It was crazy. Remember this? Yeah, the typewriter. I showed that one to my daughter. We have a, um, 
We have a technology museum at Microsoft where you can go and see old technologies. It's right across from our company store. Saw it and says, what is that? I'm like, it's a typewriter. She goes, well, what do you do with that? I go, you would write letters. She goes, where's the screen? <laughs> Honey, there was no screen. What did you use? We used paper. She says, swear to God, that's not very ecologically conscious. <laughs> That would be correct, honey, it absolutely is not. How about this one? I'd walk into companies and they'd have that in the corner, big five and a quarters. They were also the same companies, and, and I was a consultant for 15 years. I would walk into these beautiful server rooms with the big black, you know, all matching Dell logo on each one or whatever it was, the little blue light in the front you hit, and always in the corner would be a 486 turbo beige box. And you're like, what's that? That's our most important server of all. That manages our management system that calls on a 9600 baud modem every day to upload all the sales figures to 26 offices. Why has it not been updated? Well, the guy who wrote the software died. <laughs> Why not virtualize? No, we don't touch that box. No, remember, please don't even look at it. It's like the scene from Spinal Tap with all the guitars. And finally, sector-based imaging. So, the magic of the pixie stick, what's great is the deployments that I'm going to do today, I'm going to kick off off of a USB key. And where the USB key really comes in handy, and this is an 8 gig USB key, I went into MDT, built my image, I built this one with P to V, I also have one here on the right that does not have P to V, and I'm going to show what it's like to just do a standard re-image of a desktop. So if we switch between these two, Tony, if you could be so good. Yep. Go to number. The first one is a Windows XP image, so we can see there's Windows XP I've just put in the USB drive, so wait for that to come up. And the second one is a Windows 7 machine. So go ahead and switch over to the second one. Second one is a Windows oh. 7 machine, similar to what you would get. Hang on. Yeah, I'm waiting. There we go. Similar to what you would get if your UPS guy just said, hey, I got 15 brand new Lenovo laptops for you. Awesome. Bring them upstairs. By the time those get upstairs, I'm ready to image them. Although I've never seen these laptops before, because all I have to do is just have the drivers for it. So with the XP one, Uh, no, I don't, but I still need to come up, so yeah, I may need to. Let me look. So what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to go ahead and start a reboot. Oh, there it goes. Good. So I'm going to start a reboot of this one. Go ahead and hit OK on that on the XP machine. That's fine. And hold that one there. So I'm going to go ahead and hit restart on my Windows 7 machine. I'm going to switch back to the XP machine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this machine to the start point, the same point that this one's going to be at. So I'm going to hit F12. And what I'm doing, F12, 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 you can't see it just yet, and that's fine, but um, if you want to switch back to the XP machine, that'd be great. Are you at the XP machine? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not coming up. That's bad. There we go. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So on the 7 machine, don't do anything yet. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit the USB drive, and I'm going to tell it to boot off the USB drive. I'm going to do this one as a 64-bit using the 64-bit preload image that I built, and on this one, I'm going to go ahead and say migrate to Windows 7, x86. Now. This task, what we're going to do here, can be absolutely transparent to the end user. They literally boot off the stick, they hit go, and it's done. Normally I would do that, but it makes for a really crappy demo. Because you're going, hey, look, I hit a button and it's all done. You're like, what did you do? So I find it doesn't work so well in demos, so this is more manual. But I'll show you when I go into MDT where all of these choices can be pre-populated. Okay? So what I'm going to do here is this XP machine, I'm going to migrate this machine to Windows 7, I'm going to virtualize the complete XP environment. I'm going to do it all, including 40 gigs of data, in less than an hour. I'm going to do this one, actually, in about, probably in about 40 minutes. I'm going to take this machine from the OEM build of Windows 7. I'm going to put in my own custom build of Windows 7. I'm going to go to SP1. I'm going to go to IE9. And I'm going to make Office 2010. And I'm going to do this one in 17 minutes, faster than any of you can absolutely ghost it. So I'm going to kick them both off at the same See time. See if they are on the screen. Yeah, no, it won't because I'm in a pre-boot mode, so it won't just yet. So, but that's fine. I'm going to show it on that one okay. so we'll see everything else. So it's all, all good. All right. Test. Test. So everything I'm doing on this machine, you're going to see in a minute. So I'll put that one there. So my first choice is choose a migration type. Do I want to refresh this computer or upgrade? Upgrade can only happen if this is a Windows Vista machine. Cannot upgrade. I will basically refresh. By refreshing, it's going to use something called hard links migration. It's going to take all of the user data. That means everything inside the user profile. That's desktop, my docs, video, photos, all of that stuff. It's going to hold it in place. It's going to wipe out XP. It's going to put in Windows 7 plus any applications that I have sequenced inside of MDT and install those. So the user data never moves. 
everything stays in the same place. The operating system and the apps get wiped out. I put in a new OS and I migrate over the new apps, but the user settings and all that stuff stays in place. Yes, that can be non-Microsoft apps, but it has to be apps that can be sequenced into WIM files. Not all applications have that action. You had a question? Yeah, real quick. Uh, with the XP P7 refresh, yes. is the assumption that there is no full third-party full disk encryption tool? It must be unencrypted before you do this. You will have to unencrypt the drive before you do it. And hopefully you're going to be going to BitLocker. The free one, which we can set up as the last step in this, and now you tell your boss, we don't need to spend all this money on this BitLocker stuff because we get it free in Windows 7. Like I spun that around and did that. That was good. My marketing guys would be real proud of me on that one. What I really like about this um, marking of the user data on the hard disk, though, is that a migration prior to that was always like, you know, backing up the user data to the network, which is a step you actually might still want to do, in, right. you know, in case something goes wrong. Which we'll show in a second, yeah. But then the, the best thing is that you don't actually, once the migration is all successful, you don't have to copy it all back. So it will at least save you half of the copy time, which you usually have to spend yep. getting a whole network load on the network, making sure all that user data is back up somewhere. Yep. Um, so I got to kick this off because <laughs> I got about four minutes if I'm going to finish in time. So we'll all do right. that. So at this point, I can say, go ahead and script it to join the domain. I can have go out to a spreadsheet with all that information, uh, a file that has all that, or we can just say keep as a work group, have that person connect to via our VPN and then join then. Uh, where to save data and settings? Automatically, that's great. Or I can specify a location for a later restoration. I'd like to offload all the user's data onto this remote drive, the share drive. Or you know what? Just wipe the whole machine. It's a complete refresh. I can also choose where to save a complete computer backup at this point in time. This is great. Somebody said to me yesterday, well, when I get that PC perfect, I have the perfect image, how do I build it as a WIM so I can just push out that WIM to other machines? Here's where that happens. We can say, take a backup of this PC, move it over here in case I need to restore that whole PC as is in case something goes wrong or there's a problem. I can choose language packs, language and preferences, time zone. Uh, I could add a whole bunch of features for time. I'm not going to add Office at this point, but I could. Uh, Security Essentials, any one of these packs, Adobe Acrobat Reader, Flash, Silverlight, .NET Framework, whatever it is I want. I'm going to type in a highly secure password of test. And I can even add to the gentleman's question, BitLocker at this point. I can say when it's all done, BitLock. So I'm going to go ahead next. I'm going to hit begin on this one. And I'm going to go ahead and hit begin on this one. And I've got about... 37 after the hour, so we'll see how long this takes. Let's take us back to the um, PowerPoint. Which is D. Which I believe is D. Maybe not. There it is. So the Pixie Stick, the PXE Stick, the PXE Boot, we created this using MDT. When does it make sense to have a USB stick to install an OS? Now, the great thing is, is what we created in MDT, we can export to WDS, we can export to SCCM. If we build it in SCCM or WDS, we can import it into MDT. One tool to rule them all, which is great. We're not using 20 different tools that don't go images back and forth. There are three or four scenarios, and Tony and I have talked about this over the, we've been on tour for the last two weeks, and we did a tour in Europe last year, and spent a lot of time, what are great scenarios, and here's a few we came up with. My boss is XP, she needs Windows 7 before she lands. I hand her a pixie stick, I go here. Hit F12, hit start, that's all you have to do. Your machine will be off XP, it'll be on Windows 7, it'll be ready to go. Of course, some guy said, well, what if she didn't have the pixie stick? And I'm like, well, then that's not going to work. He goes, well, I could always put it in her seat before she takes off. I'm like, now you're getting into some weird TSA stuff. I would not start putting USB sticks in people's seats, a la James Bond style, on planes. <laughs> Please let me know what flights you go on so I'm not on the same ones. I want to enable remote workers to migrate to Windows 7 without sending in their laptops. How many of you support salespeople? Raise your hand. I'm very sorry you have my condolences. If you're coming to our party Wednesday night, I'll buy you a drink because you deserve several. <laughs> Salespeople are not the most technologically savvy people. I say this often. Salespeople are part of God's special children. Salespeople call a help desk and you're like, okay, launch the Internet Explorer. Which one's that? It's the big blue E. I see two E's. No, you don't. You only see one. Okay, I clicked it. Did you double click it? No, double click it. Okay, now what do I do? It's an hour long call just to get these guys to, you know, you know, SI.com, figure out what the sports scores are, poker online, whatever uh, it is that they need to do. I have do. a great one. Go ahead. I had a sales guy that called me and goes like, hey, this tech guy wants to know what memory I have. So it's like, oh, just tell him binary. <laughs> it's like, okay, 
he hung up, it was five minutes, and he was like, it's not binary. Yeah. <laughs> now, the problem with salespeople, in all honesty, is they can't be without their laptop for a day, because if they can't send you know, the PowerPoint of the 20 hottest women in America back and forth to the other sales guys, they're not really getting their job done. And for those of you who have managed exchange and go, why does the salesperson have a 14 gig PST? Spend a few minutes, take a look into it. It's rather entertaining. Hey, but it's a stressful job. It helps me to keep my job, stress down, yes. huh? But you can't tell a salesperson, hi, you're without your laptop for five days. Send it to me. That's going to take two days. I'm going to convert it over. Then you got to send it back. That's five days. That's five days that person cannot work. And that becomes a problem. By sending them a Pixie stick and saying, here, all you need to do is install it, F12, and hit OK, that's probably only an hour's worth of help desk call. But after that, it's done. It's great, because these guys are going to be migrated over without having to send in a PC. Another good instance is I want to pilot 10 machines with Windows 7. I don't want to start building a whole large deployment scale. I want to build 10 Pixie sticks, pop them in, hit go, walk away, and come back an hour later, and these machines are already converted, less in some cases. So here's the best part. MDT 2010, Windows Deployment Server, WDS, are free. There's no charge for these tools. We like free. I remember taking a look at Acronis. I love Acronis. I think Acronis makes great tools. But at $1,200 per server and $199 per client, that starts getting very pricey very quickly. And for those of you who said you're managing images, if every time a new type of PC, if you've got a Lenovo and they buy five more, you know, 25 new Lenovos, if you are going in and you are uninstalling all the crap, all the bloatware, all the crapware, Installing your own software, getting it perfect, putting in all the patches, all the antivirus and doing that, and then making the ghost image, that's taking you a lot of time. Gartner had a study, said the average IT pro was spending six hours to migrate a desktop. That's insane. If it's taking you more than an hour to 90 minutes, you are taking too long. You, and then what happens every time a new service pack comes out, every time a lot of antivirus stuff, you've got to go ahead and update those ghost images. Or else you're giving somebody a ghost image and it takes you know, after they install 63 updates that are going to take forever. There are much smarter and better ways to do that using our internal tools. One of the things I also like is the multicast functionality. Multicast functionality. So we can actually blast out laptops at different speeds. It used to be your network ran at the speed of the slowest laptop connected to it. If you're using Server 2008 R2, it's not. We can actually ghost laptops or image laptops in multiple speeds at the same time and even tell slow ones to drop off and come back later and do one group of fast and one group of medium simultaneously rather than the fast ones working at the slowest speed. Yeah, but instead of like having to send each laptop individually his image, you're now like doing a multicast type of deployment, which is one of the great features I thought was, uh, that was added there and mm -hmm. really helping to speed up those deployments. Absolutely. There was a great article about two or three weeks ago called Five Myths About Windows 7, and I really liked it because I had people that come up to me saying, you know, everything I, you know, when Microsoft says it's really easy to go to Windows 7, everything else, everybody I talk to says it's really hard. And I say, you know what? Neither's right. I'm going to tell you right here, it is not the easiest thing for many companies to move to Windows 7. There's a lot of work around application compatibility. There's a lot of work you have to do around testing your apps, deployment strategies. Plus, we're finding many companies have taken help desk workers, they've moved them into IT positions, and they're push button IT pros. They know how to hit a button to ghost a new machine. They know how to copy a user profile, but they have no clue how to do app compat. They have no clue how to do deployment because they've never done it. They've been in a maintenance mode because why? Many of the people you manage have only been working with XP. They never had Vista machines. And that's a lot of stress and pressure on you to try to teach them how to do those things. We understand that. But on the other hand, it is not the most difficult thing because not everybody is taking advantage of the tools and resources that are out there. So number one myth, you have to have an accurate sense of the scope of migration. That is absolutely true. If you do not know every app on your machine, every machine, how much RAM is in it, where it's at, it's going to go bad for you. Because you're going to find one app that you missed that you're going to migrate over that's not going to work in Windows 7. You've got to know what's on your network. We talked about Map as a tool to get a good idea, but it's not going to tell you every machine. You really need something like Asset Inventory Service or one of the higher level tools if you're not going to get somebody to walk to every machine in inventory at all. You've got to know every app, every plugin, what those people are using, what could be the blocker that keeps those folks from happening. And then is it a VPC? Is it an XP mode? Is it something to be solved? Is it money that has to be spent to upgrade to newer versions? I had a person who was very unhappy. My company's trying to move to Windows 7, and this app is not supported. I'm like, well, which version do you have? He's like, I'm running this version 6. I'm like, sir, they're on version 14 now. And version 13 and up is supported in Windows 7. Yeah, but we don't want to spend the money on it. OK, well, that I can't help you with. You know, you have, in many cases, 
bought new hardware, but you've not moved to Vista, you didn't upgrade the software, you didn't do it. So it's one of those where it's time to bite the bullet. You're gonna have to do the work and take a look at those apps and do that inventory, go through it. But there are advantages to doing this because you have that great opportunity now to sit down and really reevaluate, does this make sense? Does having five different versions of this make sense? Do we really still want to do it this way? Is this still the best software to do it? Should Bob still have rights to you know, do whatever on the network? It's a great time to clean house, to really take a step back. Are we SOX compliant, SAS compliant? All of these different things that you need to go through. Plus, you have new things like people now bringing iPads and Androids and, and consumer devices into your workplace. How are we going to manage those? How are they going to access data, and how does compliancy fit in with that? These are all questions that have to be asked. These are all things you have to take a look at. Windows 7 will seamlessly fit into your infrastructure. Very true, unless you want to use something like direct access, in which you're going to need IPv6 compliant routers to support that feature. So it may, but there may also be features in Windows 7 that you are going to want to take advantage of, which may require you to update or upgrade some, piece of some pieces of hardware within your environment. Windows 7 will extend the life of your PCs. We had a guy on the tour, we were in, um, I think it was Dallas or Chicago, one of those, and this guy says, I got Windows 7 to work on a P2 with 512 megabytes of RAM. <laughs> awesome, but what a horribly crappy user experience that is gonna be for the person who's to use that actual PC. <clears throat> Just because Windows 7 works on a PC does not mean it is a good experience for the end user. There should be a relatively modern processor, two gigs of RAM. The rule is, is if it was a Vista laptop made for Vista, it's going to run Windows 7 beautifully. If it was XP right about the time that Windows Vista came out, you're still in that bumper. This uh, Lenovo I have over there, the T60, was built for Windows XP. It runs Windows 7 very nicely. But there is a limit where you got to go, this doesn't make sense for our users. It's not a good experience. We really need to refresh, and as we buy new PCs, move these onto our Windows 7 image and move forward with that. So it's certainly <clears throat> something to keep in mind. The other thing is that new machines, of course, have the way new, better power management Absolutely. tools. So the old ones, of course, are running full power, 100% CPU all the time, which will, of course, looking at a lot of machines, yeah. will eventually, of course, cost you way much more money on, on the power consumption. Where Especially the new if you have the efficient. wireless card that goes into the PCM CIA slot because there was no wireless <laughs> built into the laptop at the time. Why am I not getting good battery life? Because you have this huge honking card that's basically connecting to the wireless network. So. And it still has that Ajir modem driver that just keeps pulling the modem. Yes. You, you want to dial? I'm ready to dial. You want to dial now? I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm looking at the modem now. So yeah. you, you ready? I'll be ready. Look, yeah. let's go if, the modem, if the modem, plug-in modem, is your primary form of communication on that laptop, it's probably too old. Migrating <laughs> from Windows 7 automatically reduces lower IT costs. We talked yesterday about some of the great features that end users can do to help fix and support themselves. But where the reduced cost comes in is from standardization. Standardization is the mantra. Standardization is what gets you from being a reactive company to proactive. When someone calls your help desk and you go, sure, go to start, programs, go down three, there's office and there's IE, awesome. When they go, you gotta find IE, and it's all over the place because the toolbar isn't standardized. Because the user is allowed to install Yahoo, Google, Bing, Incredimail, iWin, and five other toolbars, and they're wondering, why does my browser take so long to start? but they want to make that one cent every time they click on a link, that's going to cause problems. Being able to standardize the machine so that when people call for help and you go to reach out to people to help and things are in the same place for all your users is a beautiful thing. I tell people, if you know where everything is at in your house, you can close your eyes in the dark and walk through your house. If I move all the furniture and every night I'm forcing you to walk through a different house, you're going to bang into a lot of stuff. It's not going to be effective. You can't get to where you want to get quickly and easily. Standardization less control for many users, s less apps. Standardization of those apps makes a huge difference and it will reduce your management burden. So things to think about before you start to test your apps, before you roll out, as you start to look at. We talked about hard links migration, files, user accounts, account settings. This is what gets moved over. Yesterday in my session, for those of you who were there, I talked about dot. For those of you who are not, 
Dot is your user who's been working for the company for 19 years. She knows only how to hit the four icons on her desktop. She knows tools mail merge, and that's how she does it. She was taught by somebody else. She probably babysat the CEO of the company at some point and changed his diapers. She's that old. She's been there that long, but she's also the person when there's a problem, you're going to go to her desk and solve it. You're not going to call. You're not going to solve it over the phone. You're going to have to physically go down to Dot's desk, make sure her grandkids are up on her desktop, and all of her icons are there, and that's the way it works. <clears throat> how many of you support a Dot in your organization? Yeah. <laughs> or two, or three. Or worse. <laughs> 40, sure. Now, again, Dot is also one of God's special children. So something I want to throw out is we talked about everything inside the user folder when you use MDT migrates over to the new machine. But we're not talking about a regular user. We're talking about Dot. Dot is, was an actual person at a company I worked for. I went to go migrate her machine to Windows Vista at the time. And I'm looking through her machine, and I find the company financial documents inside the System32 WinNT folder. <laughs> Why are these there? Because the machine told me to put them there. No! <laughs> it did not tell you to put our financial documents in the system root folder. I guarantee you it did not. Think about that. Think about PSTs. I'll tell you a great trick I learned years ago. Take the PST, move it to the user, uh, to the My Docs folder, and hide it. That way, whenever you do a backup, the My Docs, the PST automatically comes over. Because many people, how many of you, when you were first starting your career, migrated over a user and forgot about the PST folder that was in? Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Hi, where's all my old email? This guy back here is shaking his head. He's like, yeah. Um, uh, it's safe somewhere else. <laughs> What about everything that was in my out? What about everything that was in my deleted folder? Because I have everything I've deleted for nine yeah. years. That's how I organize <laughs> stuff. Isn't one fun when you go into somebody's deleted and there's like seventeen thousand emails? Okay, I'm going to delete this. No, no, no. That's how I know I've sent stuff out. I'm like, this is your organizational system and everything inside the inbox. No separate folders. The inbox is just one big gigantic thing. Yeah, I share your pain. I have been there. So, Hardlinks migration is going to move the files. It's going to move application settings, not applications and user accounts, but make sure you check and see is all the data I need inside that folder. Okay? <clears throat> Something to think about as you're going through this. Oh, we've talked about that one. Office. Let's talk about including Office as part of this, too. So, there's a wide variety of processes we use when we go to deploy. And you're going to have to take this to whoever your C level person is, whoever manages the money. Anybody know how you find out the person who manages the funding in your company is? The person who looks like that whenever you walk in. Because it's also the, how much is this going to cost me? Hi, I have a great idea. All right, we need to do this. How much is it going to cost me? So testing process, do I need to test in hardware personnel and infrastructure? As we look at infrastructure remediation, do I have to replace all the hardware before I go to pilot? Image engineering, do I have to have an image for every single hardware class? App management, are my applications going to work? Migration, do my techs need to manually migrate everybody? Office 2, is that going to add more levels? Security, we now got to look at SOX and SAS and security policies and compliancy. With deployment, do my users need to be without their PCs for a while? And of course, operational readiness, how does this impact users and help desk? All questions that people ask as we move through this. What I like about this uh, reel that you got there, that's actually is a- My uh, wheel of pain? Yeah, the wheel of pain. The wheel of pain. <laughs> But it's actually a, a, a set of documents and tools and guidance that we have available online. Yep. So you can go to the uh, deployment toolkit mm -hmm. and find that we have documents for each and every step of that, like which are the tools that come with every step. I'm not sure everyone is aware of that, but it's a, yep. also the sample documents are in there. So it's a great set of tools. So it's a good time. Oh, I'll do one more thing. So I'm going to talk about Office real quick because people are saying we also want to deploy Office at the same time. How can that be made easier? So I'll talk for a minute kind of about Office. Then I want to jump into MDT and we want to do a, a MedB demo and check on all of our demos and see how they're doing. So the bottom line is today, what to walk away with. That hardware changes are never an issue. All you do is have to have drivers for machines. So it doesn't matter if you have one type of machine or 75 type of machines, it's one MDT image. There's no need to have more than one to manage. Your data migration is automatic. You don't need to back everything up to an external drive, ghost the image and bring everything back. Security updates. Service packs, hot fixes, language packs can all be installed at the same time. It's not something separate that we need to manage. We're able to refresh the hardware. We're able to make the process fast. We can test wisely, and that means fewer help desk calls. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip ahead, and I'm going to jump into MDT and start to talk about MDT. So this is the MDT toolkit. When you bring up the information center, 
and you go to components, we see all the components, map, act, all the things you need. Are they here? Are these the latest versions? Are they installed? Are they ready to go? We have everything worked for. We can do a check for updates. It'll go out. It'll say, you know, I need to connect to the internet. Not going to do it because it'll take a few minutes, but it'll go through. Are these the latest versions? And it will make sure you have the latest version of everything you need. So you don't have to go out and download, install 50 tools. You have one management console that will bring a lot of the ones we talked about in our 20 tool session down for you automatically. So here's a share that I built. I went into my C drive. I created a share called MDT. It's all I needed to do, and it will build everything out. So the first step is operating system. So let's go through what you have to do if you're going to ghost. You've got to take that machine. Like I said, you've got to clean out all the crap where all the things you don't want, get it all ready, install the service packs, all the antivirus updates, manually remove eight, install nine, get all the toolbars ready, get it beautiful and looking really good, and then send it up to your server. How long does that take? About an hour, two hours, you think, roughly? Somewhere in there? Don't forget okay. the sysprep. Yeah, and the sysprep and all. I'm not even getting into that yet. And you've got to have <laughs> floppies or USBs for all the machines that are going to connect, have 12 boots, all that. So <laughs> operating systems. I'm ready to install an operating system. I want to package an operating system. I simply go to import an operating system. I have a choice. Give me a DVD, CD, or equivalent. Give me a WIM file that you have built or Point me to a Windows deployment server that already has a Windows image on it and let me import it. This takes about 10 to 12 minutes. And it will take the whole operating system, rip it off the disk, and put it into all, the comp all of the components that are needed. Now let me do something. Can you switch me to C? Yep. 17 minutes. I have now taken that Windows 7 machine. I'm going to go to a higher screen resolution so it looks a little bit better. Crank that up. Apply. There we go. Changes. Very nice. So not only have I done that, but I've also done and installed Microsoft Office. There is full version of Word 2010. And oops. There's Internet Explorer 9. I went to Windows 7 SP1, removed IE8, installed IE9, and installed Office 2010 in 18 minutes from a machine that was literally just unboxed. How many of you can do that with Ghost from the time you unbox it to you're ready to go? The only thing that I needed to do was go to Lenovo's website and download the drivers that this laptop requires, which will take you about 10 minutes. That's all I needed to do to prepare. Everything else, Windows, my applications were already uh, inside of MDT. They were already on the stick. All I needed to do was download the new drivers, recompile it, and update my image. That's it. That's pretty cool, isn't it? OK, let's go back to MDT. Yeah, let's go ahead and, let, 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 and let's check this one. So if we go to the XP image, we'll see if we can see it. We can. So what we can see is it's installed the operating system. It's copied over all the Windows files. It's expanded. This is a 5400 drive. It is a Centrino Duo processor. This is an older laptop, so it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, we're now installing all the updates. We've installed Windows. We've installed all the features. We're installing all the updates. It's completing installation. Then it's going to reboot, and then it's going to start to unpackage the VHD. And we'll come back. And what's cool is there's a little window where you can see the XP mode window and all the XP mode being built inside of this. So we'll have Windows installed plus the data carried over probably in about another five minutes, and we'll start to see the VHD being unpackaged and built inside of this. I'll actually show you at the end, I can launch IE6 inside of Windows 7 and IE9 simultaneously and run them back to back. So we'll come back. So we're chugging along nicely. So for my operating system, here's where I do it. The nice thing is, is when SP1 comes out, I have two options, either import the service pack or import Windows 7 SP1 in and make that now my new base image. And you can see I've got XP, because I can do XP, Vista, or 7 with MDT. I've got a x86 version and an x64 version set up. The machine's going to take a look when I go to run this and say, hi, I'm 64-bit. I need the 64-bit. I'm 32. I need the 32-bit. It'll do that through BIOS and callouts very nicely. My favorite part, drivers. There's already a whole bunch of drivers already in here. All I need to do is go to the manufacturer, download the EXEs and the DLLs. I put them into a folder. I hit import. It rips out the DLLs and automatically brings them in. What's also nice is if Bob, your salesperson, connects to five printers, you can pre-install all the printer drivers. If he connects to an HMI, human machine interface, 
we can install those drivers. A plotter printer, we can pre-install those drivers. No, going out to the web looking for drivers the first time that person connects. All of that is already built in. Every driver that user needs. When the driver gets old, if you go, hey, there's a new version of uh, this Rico company driver that we need to use, sure, no problem. So I go here, I choose delete, I go next, next, it pulls it out, I'm done. I go to import drivers, I point it towards the new one I download, I bring it in, I recompile my image. My image is on a share that all of us using MDT, WDS, or SCCM use, so everybody now has the latest image, they recompile, we're ready to go. That's it. All you're doing is managing operating systems, si uh, operating systems, drivers, and service packs. No more having to manage images. I gotta say that uh, a lot of vendors, of course, today are really helpful with <clears throat> providing drivers that you can just import. Yep, <clears throat> absolutely. And some of them, when they have just an executable, some of the video drivers, you might have to run that setup uh, that actually, when it's ready to install, mm -hmm. actually go to the folder and unpack that and copy that over and yep. import that one. So It'll do it all for you. As for things like the IE service pack, IE9, we've automatically installed IE9, and all we did was we went into our XML script and we said, uninstall eight, install nine. And we just told it where to do it in the process, and that can be scripted in, which makes it very easy to do. Because if we right click, uh, you know, you can see here, here's the package GUI, here's the path, here's the product version, all of that is automatically put in. And I can build it into my task sequences. Applications, I have Office sequenced in here. For a new application, I say here's the source files, here's the UNC where the source files are, and it's an application bundle. And as long as I can package it in a Microsoft MSI or WIM file, I'm ready to go. I can also do Adobe Acrobat. I can do a ton of, uh, of different uh, products by just literally importing them and bringing them in. If you can sequence it, you're ready to go. So we have our applications. And I'll go here into Office. And this is really cool, because inside of Office, I have my details. It's a standard version, et cetera. I have dependencies. I can say, you know what, before I install Office Pro Plus, please make sure to install this version of .NET Framework. Or before I install Link, install Office. Before I install Goldmine or Act, install Office because it's required to be in there. I can choose the order that these come in. Because somebody said, well, can I choose the order these applications install? Absolutely we can. And for Office 2010, I can even go through and choose the different setups for different versions. These people get standard. These people get Pro Plus. These people get you know this version. So we can pick which version. I can add in a product key. If I'm not using a, uh, a KMS server, I can hard put in a product key. So it's automatically in there. We don't need to worry about it. And what it does see is because it sees it as the Office, it automatically adds that button there for the Office customization tool. Yep. So you can further customize that full Office experience. You already set the locations for instance, where you have shares that are, have to be trusted locations. So you can upfront, before you actually have Office deployed, already pointed out some of the locations on your network where trusted locations have to be. You can already set certain security settings when it comes to macros uh, or, or which features you want installed. Yep. So we can go in, and this is for Office 2010. We can go in, for example, into modify user settings. We can go to Outlook, we can go to Account Settings, and we can automatically pre-set up all the exchange. Here's Cache Mode, here's Offline Address, Book, Enable RPC, Don't. All the settings, there are 1,400 settings we can pre-set up for Office in here. These will go out to users as you push it out through SCCM or WDS, or become a standard piece as we push this out on a USB key to that single user who's never going to connect to the domain, but we still want them to have control over what they're going to be able to use, what they can't use, and how. And we can lock that down as part of that base image. Something we absolutely cannot customize out. And we can choose. This sales group gets this, you know, help desk gets this, et cetera. We can break that down by group, which gives us a lot of customization that we can start to work with, which yeah, is so, absolutely so instead tremendous. Of, instead of like managing all these different images, we are now sort of like being able to sort of create a sequence, task sequence, mm -hmm. where you can say like, this is the image for finance, this is the image for logistics. And then based on what task you basically choose, that will choose, you know, that application, that version of Office is going to go in yep. there. We need these plugins to be added. Yes, they're going to need this tool and this yep. tool. And it's completely dynamic. So you basically have just a set of building blocks. And then using a simple task sequence, you're just going to say, like, describe actually the image you want to have built there on the fly, right? Yep. If we want to do something even as simple as when somebody launches Outlook, this is our intranet page, and it should automatically come up inside of Outlook. You can add that right here so every user gets that. Things that you're spending time batch filing or scripting, we don't need to do that. 
Batch files being replaced by PowerShell. Scripting is now being able to done inside of these tools. We're making it easier through GUI interfaces for end users to do what you need to do and not have to start learning how to batch script, how to command line script, how to have startup scripts that run, that take tons of time and users go, why is my PC taking so long because I've got to wait 10 minutes for this user script to go to connect to all these drives and grab all this stuff. You can build that right in so that doesn't have to happen. It makes for a better end user experience. So beyond Office, I now have my task sequences, so I can go in here and I can build, let, let's build a custom task sequence. So I can say I want to build a new sequence. I'm going to call this task sequence ID test, and I'm going to do test. It's going to go, okay, great. So is this a standard client task sequence? Is this a sysprep? Is this a light touch? Is this a standard client task sequence with P to V migration? Because I've added the P to V plugin. Is this a client replace task sequence with P to V? Is this just a custom task sequence with P to V? So I can say, you know what? This is a custom task sequence with P to V. I also like the sysprep and capture option. So let's say you have a machine, you fully install it, you have all the applications in there, and that's going to be the base that you want to install it. You can actually do the sysprep and capture option there and, and use that as well. Yep. Um, that's with control. Yes, I was missing that. So <laughs> we're going to pick the P to V. We're going to hit next. It's going to say, oh, I need to go back. I want to do a standard. Sorry. Standard. Great. It's going to go and say, okay, what operating system are we putting in? Are, are we choosing all of these or one of these? Now I'm going to want to make this a 64-bit task sequence. Okay, cool. Do I want to put in a specific product key or a, sp a multiple key? Nah, I'm good with just a specific one. What's the name? What's the organization? What's it going to be? What's the admin password going to be? All right, that's fine. We'll uh, do not specify one at this time or put in whatever we want. I have my summary. It's going to go ahead and it's going to build it. Great, it's built. Here's my test sequence. So now I can go here into properties. I can go here into, and I can say, this can only be run on the specific platforms. This is only for Windows XP machines. So I can go down and I can say, you know what, just pick my XP, SP2, SP3, et cetera. These are the only ones that allow this to be ran. I can run this on any platform. I can go to my task sequence, and I see here, OK, I want to gather local data, validation. Remember you saw that BitLocker screen? There's that BitLocker screen. Remember I told you that you can have all the information already filled in for the end users or to be gathered from a script or from a spreadsheet? It's all right here. There's that same screen. And if I would have filled this out and said BitLock at the end, it would have ran a BitLock at the end of that passage. I can restore the VHD. Where do I want to do it? Options. And the great thing is, is when I get to any of these, like install apps, I have if statements. If it's this machine, do this. If it's not in the sales OU, don't install. If it's not help desk, if help desk, install standard. If not help desk, install pro. Task sequence variable. So I can go in here and say, so what is it? If this exists, if it's equal to not greater than value. Here's my if statement, any conditions, all conditions. And I can go through and if any of the conditions are true, not true. I can do an operating system version. If the architecture is, again, I have great control over this. I can do installed software, pick this MSI, drop it in, match the specific product code, match it only to an upgrade code. So I can go through and I can say every group's going to get their own image. But am I building multiple images and multiple machines for different groups? No. I'm doing everything here. I'm just building task sequences that says, hi, if it's this person, grab this, grab this, and grab these drivers. If it's this type of machine, grab this and this and these drivers. Yes, sir. Well, it's, if you're going from XP to 7, it's automatically going to wipe out the whole OS and the drivers. You can choose only these new drivers include, you have a choice. You can actually say put all the drivers in there, just put in these ones. But it should by BIOS, by version of the machine, say these are the drivers that I need and only grab those out. The other thing is that when you sysprep it, you have the option to wipe out the plug and play information. So when it first boots, it will go and do the plug and play detection using the drivers you've added in it. Yeah, there's an option in the sysprep. So the sysprep has an option to either say, like, okay, to also you know, wipe out the, the plug and play uh, information, which is the default, actually. So by the default, if you capture an image that way, and you're going to run that image the first time on a new machine, the first thing it will do is like go out there and do the plug and play detection on what hardware is in there, which HAL do they need, and everything is being detected and then installed. 
using the drivers you've added. So if the driver's not there, it will just say like uh, unknown device and then it will try to detect it afterwards when it's got the internet connection. But it's a great way because we, for instance, I built a machine. We had a, um, an apartment for demonstrations in the Netherlands. We had 20 vendors coming and bringing their latest model of laptop in there. And we said, like, you know, we're going to give trainings there. We want to be able to reset it at the end of the day. So when the next, you know, class comes in the next day, all these laptops are the same. Well, because these are so, you know, brand new OEM machines, they have very specific drivers and everything. So what we did is we built a WDS server with the MDT. We built the capture uh, functionality. So we, we got rid of most of the OEM tools, but had every drive and everything there. Had it sort of like... Uh, capture the image, bring it back to the WDS server, and now when they boot, they can basically say like, okay, put that image back on those laptops. So it's one of the, one of the steps we you know, choose to get that OEM image back, because there was a specific task we were going to do. Of course, we could have gone and like made one image and added all the OEM drives to that, but in this case, there was an easier way to just grab it and sysprep it. But when the first time the machine is on there, it will actually go out there and plug and play all the hardware that's in that machine and find the latest drives that I've added uh, using uh, the MDT. So here's the sysprep capture task sequence. You can see set the image build, catch image flags, set the PE state, configure. You have all those settings here. So you can go and customize any of those with any of those statements and build that out as you so see fit. We have some great documentation that will walk you through all of this on Springboard. You want to see the boot of the... Uh... Yeah, I'm going to switch over to that. So we can see Windows 7 on our XP machine is already fully installed. And we can see here that you've got the Windows XP image, because we can see the Windows XP piece building in there. So Windows 7 is fully installed, data's migrated over, and I've still got about, yeah, it looks like about nine minutes or so until that XP image is fully built in. So what I will see, and this is where we're gonna see it, is Windows 7's here, but I'm gonna start to see down here, inside of all programs, inside a virtual PC, I'm gonna see a folder called old apps, and I'll see IE6 in there and I'll see Office and any of the apps that would have been installed inside my old XP machine will all be listed there and anybody could click any one of those. So I'm not running a VPC desktop. I just will have all those apps inside of 7 that I'll be able to click. And when this is done, I'll go ahead and I'll launch IE6 and show you how IE6 comes up and I can run IE9 simultaneously and do those back to back. So that's what it's doing. It's going to go through a few reboots to do that and we'll put that together. So I'm going to finish this, and then I want to show you MedV, because as we're bringing up IE6 in this, again, we still have to crack open that desktop, join it to the domain, add all of our antivirus and all the other stuff in patches. So we'll go through MedV, and we'll do that in just a minute. Let me just finish up here with MDT. No, don't switch it. So we're on the P to V? P to V. Oh, sorry. That's okay. You have to join it to the domain? But the P to V, you're going to want to, as you're not going to be able to manage it unless you go right to that machine. Doesn't make a difference. It's a brand new, it doesn't make a difference. You're still going to have to go in. You're still going to have to rejoin it because it's removed itself. It's just moved the apps over. It's now inside a virtual PC. So you're going to make sure that it's joined. You're going to want to double check the antivirus, make sure it's still connected. All the settings you need to go through and you're going to manually want to check that. But it usually unhinges itself. There are some weird cases where it hasn't. But it usually removes itself as it goes through that set. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it loses the trust. <coughs> sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of funky. The, the P2P does do the sysprep as well. It does do the sysprep, so it should remove everything. But every once in a while it doesn't, but it should. And I would count mm -hmm. on it basically saying, it's a brand new XP instance with these apps and the user data already in there. Yep. Okay. So I want to do uh, one more thing here. I want to now show, now that we have this, how do we build out that USB key? Well, what you do is you literally take a USB key, make it bootable. If you don't know how to do that, go out to my blog. I have a great um, post that uh, I'll refer to in a few minutes. We can go here, choose our rules, but here it is. Generate a light touch bootable ISO, generate a light touch WinPE WIM file. You basically, and very simply, take the USB key, make it bootable, drop it in, and then you literally just drag over the files from MDT into it. So you'll see here, if I go here to computer, and I go into my removable disk here, I see here's my boot folder. Zoom in on that a bit. Here's my deploy folder. I got my file repository, I have my migrate me, which is some data that I put in there just for fun, and I have my auto run, and inside there I've added like some wallpapers and some things along that line. So that's it, that's all I need to do is simply is just to build it out and do that. Yeah, do uh, No, be careful with the download tool, it's a little bit different. Um, for that one, because we're not actually putting the USB and the DVD on there, so you get, I'll actually show You got show the, the ISO, do you, when you built the ISO you can use that? 
No. Okay. No, the ISO you're just going to basically stick in the DVD or pull it in, you'll basically pull that out. So it will do this all for you. It's then going to build this ISO, which will include the drivers, the apps, and everything else, and you just put it onto your bootable USB key. So I'm going to let Tony show MedV. Yep. <clears throat> Go back, just come back to this one just for a second. All right. And we can see more of the XP stuff is being built. We can now see the whole backgrounds are there. Uh, let's see how we're looking here. Let's see if more of our VPC stuff, no, still being built. So we'll give it a few minutes. Tony, why don't you go ahead and show us uh, MedV and how that is a little bit different there. Yeah, absolutely. So when we look at MedV, MedV is the, like we talked about, the, the tool in MDOP. And right now we've got the new MDOP 2011 suite, which is available to download on Tagnet Plus if you have a subscription for that. Of course, it's also in your uh, uh, software assurance mm -hmm. uh, benefits. So MedV 2.0 comes basically with um, a whole new um, approach because MedV 1 required a whole infrastructure. You had servers that were managing images. You, you had the SysPep to deploy these images. And we made it a lot simpler in, in MedV 2.0. MedV 2.0 basically comes with the workspace packager, which basically allows me to go and build a custom um, virtual PC XP image, which I'm going to deploy in my environment for those applications I cannot get to migrate and I'm still working on those. So at this point, what I've done is I've taken Virtual PC, I've started a new Virtual PC, installed our volume license XP on there, added the applications that I know don't run, and then I sysprepped that whole Virtual PC and I have this VHD file. So from that point on, I'm gonna take that VHD file and create it as a package that I wanna deploy in my organization. So what I'll do is I go and create a MedV workspace package. So I can say this is the Windows XP for finance. Hit next. First thing that'll ask me in this wizard is like, where is that VHD of the Windows XP image that you've sysprepped? So I'm gonna browse for that, which I have right here. <clears throat> Hit next. And here's, here's just the first things that, you know, when it's gonna set up, do you wanna inform the user? Do you wanna do it in the background? Yes. I would like to inform the user, I want to create a unique MedV workspace for each user on the computer, and I can manage that administrator group there uh, with a tool otherwise than MedV. The next thing is really nice, because when it's setting up, I can actually here specify which uh, message I want to show to the end users. Um, if an error occurs, what message I want to show you. And also I can add a little URL here to an intranet site uh, to give them for more uh, information. Then the computer name. <clears throat> like Stephen told, the computers, of course, the virtual um, MedV images, are in fact just other, you know, more machines that I need to manage. So I want to be able to really quickly find those in my uh, Active Directory or group policy. So you can see here that during the initial setup, I'm going to create a computer name. There's a lot of different options you have. You can, you know, do a custom one. I'll randomly take the one with the MedV some username, some host name, and then a random fill to easily recognize those. Now this is one of the things I really like about MedV. So if you have an international uh, organization, you're gonna deploy this image in different set, in different regions, like how do you know what region the image is gonna show up? And I really love this because it basically goes out to the client it's gonna uh, start this MedV image on and just copy those settings for regional, for the user, even the user domain, I can copy that from the host. So the next thing is what I want to do with um, startup. Uh, I want to start up my MedV environment as soon as the user logs on, so they have a complete transparent experience. I can do networking, shared or bridged. And in this case, I'm gonna enable the storing of the credentials because I want to have that single sign-on experience for the user. I don't want to you know, log in with a, another login or something. Here's that web URL redirection we talked about. So I can add some websites that are on the internet, uh, or perhaps even websites we use a lot from a, from a partner. And I basically here add the URLs, that whenever the user hits that URL, I want them to have that in a IE6 experience. So I can just add, let's for um, now just add msn.com. Do another one, and I can do HTTP finance, and can do things like that. Hit next. This is the summary, and right now I could go out and create 
create that package. What it will create for me is a MatV image, but also have a setup.exe to be able to quickly install that image. What that installation does is besides adding virtual PC to my machine, which you'll see right here, is it also, of course, adds the MatV image. It also adds the integration between my Windows 7 image right here and that MatV image. So to show an, um, an example of that is if I go to my browser, I'm on IE9, I can go to Bing. I've added that MSN site to the URLs that I want to be able to have the compatibility mode. So I'm going to hit msn.com, and what you'll see right now is bang. There's IE6. It's almost like a transparent end user experience. I would really love to go to the US. OK. And here I am in, in IE6 launching that, that page. Um, going back and minimize that, you can see that IE9 actually came with a page that says, like, hey, this web page is being opened in an early version of Internet Explorer. So it goes transparently back and forth. Trying another one, uh, the one they added here, new.nl, same thing. So immediately just goes in, puts that IE9 in a you know, web page is opened in the previous version of Internet Explorer, and it opens IE6 for me. Now, any applications that I would like to use that are not running on Windows 7, completely transparent experience there as well, because I can go here into my start menu, and if I uh, hover <laughs> uh, over this command prompt, you can see that it actually says this is the command prompt on the virtual machine. The same goes for this XML notepad. So the user really doesn't see that this is virtual. So clicking this one will just launch that application from the XP virtual machine. So it's a complete transparent um, experience for the user. Just seems like this application is running on their machine. If I'm going to open files, go computer, you can actually see that the C drive for my physical machine is also added there. So I can just go there, go to my documents, and open up these files I might want to use. Now, XML Notepad, of course, will work just fine on Windows 7. It's just one of those examples I wanted to uh, point out and have that uh, in there. Uh, also, the command prompt, of course, is fun uh, type version. And this is Windows XP version 1.5, 5.1. Yep. So yeah, how far are we with the migration? We're just about done. So like, let's click it over, because I can actually uh, show this. So, so in the last step or two of restoring the user state, it'll be done here in about 30 seconds. But here's what I can show you. So I'm going to go here to all programs. And inside that virtual PC, hey, look, old OS programs, IE6. So. I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually launch the IE9 that's on this machine. There it is. Oh, no, it's IE8. Sorry. I didn't do IE9 on this one. I did IE8. So that's there. I'm going to type in that high security test password that I used when I blew this out. It's going to come up and launch it. While it's doing the last few seconds of my user state, I'm going to kind of make it jump forward and do this. I'm all aware. And hey, look at that. I have IE8. And note, look what that IE6 can't do because it's not really inside of it. Notice I have no arrow glass, but there it is. I'm running two versions <coughs> side by side. I could be running my old XP apps in there. I can be doing that at this point. Well, it was kind of funny. You saw the balloon popping up there like you don't have the antivirus installed. Right. That's actually coming from the XP machine mm -hmm. that is popping through on the Windows 7 environment and showing yep. you that actually that you need to manage that. And we can see that well. my deployment's now successful. So in less than 60 minutes, so in 18 minutes, I took an out-of-the-box Windows 7 machine, put our custom image, <coughs> upgraded it from 7 to SP1, all of the antivirus, all the updates, re replaced 8 with 9, and installed Office 20 Pro in, in 17, 18 minutes. And in less than an hour, I took a machine from XP with all of that user data, migrated it to Windows 7, which I was able to do in a relatively short period of time, about 20, 25 minutes, but take the complete Windows XP machine virtualize it inside of Windows 7 and give that user full access to every application they had on that machine before while all of their data and user information has been migrated into the new Windows 7. And I did it all with free tools. What do you think? All right. Thank you. So let me just point this out. And then I got, I got about five, six minutes for questions. So don't leave just yet. I mean, just 30 seconds. So now you're like, I don't have a question. I'm just going to go on my next session. So. <laughs> Some blog posts to be aware of, and this will be up on the decks and all that. I have a great blog post if you go to Windows Team Blog, click in the Springboard area, you can type in Light Touch Bootable, and you'll get these posts. 
Building a light touch bootable USB. We got a bunch of questions when I started doing the session about a year ago. How do I make that bootable USB drive? Some of that. It's all there. If you want to add Office, there were some additional questions. We did a second post. Jeremy Chapman, very smart guy. We hate Office because they stole him away and now he's working for the Office team. Wrote a really great uh, piece on why you would want to look at MDT uh, over sector-based imaging tools like Ghost. And finally, manually performing the P2V migration with software assurance. There's a complete walkthrough on how to do that. Windowsteamblog.com. Click on Springboard or find me on the floor and we'll do that. The P2V actually, we didn't actually mention that, but it's a great job Jeremy also did in yeah. getting that supported. With Absolutely. The and that is a supported tool. Absolutely, yeah. which is a great thing. So Windows Team Blog, just click on Springboard and memorize the full URL. It's out <laughs> there. For those of you that would like to see that MDT portion, kind of the second half of this presentation, done a little bit longer, more in depth. I'll be doing it again at five. I will probably have the same jokes, not too many new ones, I apologize. So if you go, hey, that's awesome, I want to see it again, come back. If you've got a good handle on it, just a few questions, grab, feel free, you won't hurt my feelings, grabbing something else at five. But definitely fill out some surveys if this was helpful. How many of you, this was helpful, that this is going to make a difference? Awesome, that's Thank you. what I love to see. Great, well worth your time, good use of an hour and 15 minutes. Cool, well, I would we have questions? Come we have forward. Any? Oh, we got giveaways, so if you have some questions, We'll do this. For those who want to go, go. For those who have questions, come on up to the front. I got five or six kind of cool giveaways, but we'll try to answer questions. Thanks so much. Have Thank a great you. day, everybody.